So now is the time that we've all been waiting for. We're going to get into the millennial micro generations. Now the thing about millennials is that they are by far the most hated generation in history. They are known as lazy. They are known to kill multiple industries. They are apparently entitled, narcissistic, but they also comprise the majority of Trend Hunter's office. So of course we want to hop to their defense. The thing is that if you talk to a couple of millennials, they'll be more than happy to tell you that perhaps they don't know how to handle their money because they don't make a lot of it. Or maybe they are known as narcissists because young people throughout the ages have been known to be more narcissistic. So let's deep dive that millennial generation to learn a little bit more about why they are how they are. Born between 1982 and 1998, this generation is known by 9-11 ushering them into childhood, the recession ushering them into adolescence, and frequently using social media, which is true. We use social media a lot. There are actually three micro generations within the millennial demographic because they are the largest in the US. Those three are the pro-millennial, mid-millennial, and the nouveau millennial. So let's kick off with our oldest millennial group, the pro-millennial. The pro-millennial's name is Josh. Born between 1982 to 1987, they're currently between 31 to 36 years old, with 25 million in the US and 600 million globally. Now the pro-millennial formative years do look a little similar to what we saw with Gen Zenos back in the Gen X module of this course. They were born into a time of a sense of panic and in fact were born with the peak divorce rates in history, which means that they were actually the last generation to be able to go outside and play without someone breathing down their neck. Mostly, they were unsupervised in childhood. Now we move into their adolescence, and again we see that theme of pop culture being the glue that brings them and their friends together. Music was a big part of this generation's life at the time, however, it wasn't grunge music the way it was with Gen Zenos. For them, it was what was charting which for the first time in history was rap music. NWA was the first rap group to have a number one billboard hit in the early 90s. Now when you combine that with the fact that this generation had social technologies, obviously not the kind of social technology we have today, things like flip phones and gaming consoles that are just cool enough to get their friends to come over and check out their new Nintendo 64, then you see that this adolescence was all about bonding and rebelling. Now, early adulthood for this generation was ushered in with home computing, which changed everything. They had the opportunity to access the internet, to eventually start using early social media, like a MySpace, and then over time, get those smartphones that rule our lives today. Now, although this was a lot of fun, it also coincided with this generation entering into the workforce. And so all of a sudden, the access of information made everything more competitive than it used to be. Everyone was way smarter than they were before. Combine that with 9-11 and early adulthood for this generation was themed by fear. Now, the first few years of full adulthood for this generation were fortunate because although they worked through the recession, they had more time to recover from that debt than other millennial micro generations. They also had more time to recover because they were more resourceful. I'll give them that. Now, when we talk about this generation, one song that springs to mind is Eminem's Lose Yourself, which admittedly a lot of pro-millennials don't necessarily love. But I will say that the lyrics of this song, which charted in 2004 when they were in their teens and their 20s, point to values that are important to them. This idea of hustling and rising up against whatever trials and tribulations are in your path. This is, after all, a very resourceful generation. And to the point of the pro-millennial being resourceful, 50% of American millennials have a side hustle, aka a secondary stream of income. All because the pro-millennial is highly resourceful, but also very determined and actually very competitive. Now the fact that they're competitive isn't just about listening to rap music, it's also when they started using social media. As I said earlier, social media came to be when this generation was already in those early years of adulthood. And so they actually associate using social media with the opportunity to brag about adult milestones. 73% of pro-millennials found their last position through a social media site, and 81% of them have shared a photo of their baby online. 
Milestone Social is an insight that shows that even some social media sites are accommodating this by creating different features and devices that make it easier for the pro-millennial to share that adult achievement. One great example of this comes to us from a tech university in China. They've actually outfitted their diplomas with an AR opportunity that you can view through WeChat. So if you decide to share a photo of your diploma online through WeChat, you can actually view an interactive version of it on your phone. This speaks to the idea that the pro-millennial is very competitive, is very determined to reach that next phase in life, and overall is highly resourceful. Now we get into the mid-millennial. The mid-millennial's name is Jessica. Born between 1988 to 1993, the mid-millennials between the ages of 25 to 30, with 24 million peers in the US and 610 million globally. Now the mid-millennial formative years are similar to what we saw with the pro-millennial, but those peak divorce rates happened pretty much when they were born. It also coincided with the rise of helicopter parenting, which some experts say is actually a guilt-ridden response to the sudden onslaught of the non-nuclear household. Even if a mid-millennial were born to parents who decided to stay together, suddenly the non-nuclear family was all over television. Full House, Fresh Prince, The Gilmore Girls. You pair that with 9-11 and you get parents who feel that they need to be as involved as possible in their child's life. Now then we move into their adolescence and the household computing that changed the pro-millennial's adulthood changes the mid-millennial's adolescence entirely. Household computing came with internet access and early social media like, once again, MySpace, and that made for digital comparison. Yes, at the time, the mid-millennial loved using social media and the internet, but was it really wise to give preteens the opportunity to compare themselves to near strangers online? Probably not. Now into their early adulthood, which is themed by smartphones, the recession, and graduating into an unstable job market. Essentially, in early adulthood, the mid-millennials started to doubt themselves, which takes us into where they are today, adulthood. And adulthood for the mid-millennial is all about financial instability, because they haven't had time to recover from the recession just yet, impersonal modes of communication, because they've been using social media for so long, and delayed milestones, because Really, a lot of them can't afford to buy houses or have kids. And yes, they are super duper anxious about it. Now, oftentimes when we talk about the mid-millennial, we talk about this concept of adulting. So this idea that this generation doesn't really know how to or particularly want to take on the responsibilities that we associate with being an adult. But the problem with that is that it isn't entirely their fault. It has a lot to do with the fact that that culture of comparison was introduced to them so early on when social media came to be when they were in their teens. And that culture of comparison is unfortunately still alive and well. If you check out Instagram, you'll see photos that tell you the right way to work out, the right way to go on vacation, the right way to have a baby, to hang out with your friends, even the right way to work. And yes, that is the Trend Hunter office. Now, the American Psychology Association is quite worried about this generation. They say that millennials face more competitive environments, unrealistic expectations, and anxious and controlling helicopter parents than generations before. They've even coined a term for this generation, multidimensional perfectionism, which refers to the idea that for the mid-millennial, they don't feel successful when they get the job they've always wanted, or become engaged to someone they really love, or buy their first property. It all has to happen at once for it to truly feel like success. And it is a lot of pressure to put yourself under. And so the song for this generation is All of the Lights by Kanye West. Like all the other songs for the micro generations, it came out in a pivotal time in their lives, in their teens and their 20s. But if you listen to this song, which won the Grammy for Best Rap Song in 2010, you can tell that the lyrics are all about familial trauma, life in the public eye, and the pressures and expectations that society places on us, for better or for worse. Now this is something that definitely speaks to the mid-millennial. In fact, the pressures that they feel are not just societal and focused on social media, they're also financial. This generation was either in post-secondary accumulating debt when the recession hit, or just graduating to a very unstable job market. 
And so they haven't had a lot of time to recover. They actually have more debt than any other micro generation within the millennial demographic. And that may be why your mid-millennial employees seem kind of disengaged. The fact of the matter is that all those industries that mid-millennials are rumored to be killing, you know, home ownership, weddings, having kids, buying cars, are really just a result of them not being able to afford nice things or even in a lot of cases, average things. Greg Sabatier, the founder of Millennial Money, says that money has really just become a tool to make experiences in life possible because the mid-millennial no longer believes in financial stability. Now, all of that said, what that means is that today's mid-millennial is highly anxious, but also very experience-driven and just aspiring to do well in the world. Monetary mindfulness is an insight that speaks to what's important to them. It highlights different ways to combine this idea of financial goal setting with the sort of anxiety calming feel that the mid-millennial craves. Now, a great example, and one of my favorite microtrends of the last year is Financial Gym. The Financial Gym is a service that actually treats being a financial advisor the way you would treat being a personal trainer, a person who needs to be there to motivate as well as educate. Overall, the mid-millennial is anxious, experience-driven, and just aspiring to something great. And now we get into the baby of the millennial demographic, the nouveau millennial. Matt is between the ages of 20 to 24. There are 22 million nouveau millennials in the US and 590 million globally. Now the nouveau millennial formative years have a little bit less trauma than what we see with the mid-millennial and even the pro-millennial. Yes, they were born to helicopter parents, but specifically these are parents who weren't in the midst of these sort of high numbers of divorce. For them, what was tough is the fact that their parents felt like they needed to go beyond being involved and go into protecting them from all the bad things happening in the world, like the rise of the internet and of course 9-11. But one thing that the adolescence of the nouveau millennial teaches us is that you cannot stop the power of the internet because even though their parents didn't want them to use the internet that much, they were the first generation of kids to have smartphones, making for an adolescence of digital development. Now, early adulthood for this generation saw the rise of not just social media, but using digital means for all sorts of social interactions, like Tinder, which to date is now in 196 countries across the world. This also happens to be the most educated of all of the micro generations within the millennial demographic. But unfortunately, they also graduated to that poor job market and are using their social life as a kind of distraction. Now, where they are today is just the beginnings of adulthood. And they're highly ambitious, but they're also very unsure of what happens next. They've worked more unpaid internships than any other millennial micro generation. And so really they're feeling quite uncertain about the next steps. Now, as I said, they were born to parents who were not just involved, but felt that they needed to protect them. And so for this generation, a lot of who they are is themed by that sort of push and pull with their parental figures. There's also the idea that a lot of them have worked unpaid internships, 64% in fact. Now you may be thinking unpaid internships aren't necessarily a bad thing. They give you a sort of way to break into an industry if you don't have experience. But the problem is that the spread of unpaid internships reflects this growing gap between millennial haves and millennial have nots, AKA millennials whose parents who love them and want to protect them can either pay for them working for free or can't. Turns out the split is just about half, as 44% of college-educated nouveau millennials are still underemployed. The sad thing is that they're not even aiming for that multidimensional perfectionism that we saw with the mid-millennials. No, all they want is something a little bit more simple. The top three qualities that young millennials associate with success are a sense of balance in their lives, a sense of flexibility and autonomy, and a sense of purpose. Now, when we take stock of everything, we see that helicopter parenting has made for nouveau millennials who are highly confident and feel supported and are quite optimistic. But it also means that they expect things to go well, are confused when they don't, and are frustrated because they haven't developed the sort of problem solving skills that come with age as yet. And so the song for this generation is Lean On by Major Lazer. 
Now, Lean On feels like it came out like yesterday, I know, but it actually came out in 2015, again when this generation was in their teens and their 20s. Now, it sounds like a party song, but when you listen to the lyrics, they're actually really depressing. According to Genius, this song is an Indian-influenced reggae house song about the exhilaration and disappointment of youth. Wow, pretty bleak, right? And really speaks to the idea that the nouveau millennial is sort of of two minds. They are expecting things to go well, and they are very optimistic, but they're also still very unsure and sort of using their social life as a distraction. Now, the reason why they're using their social life as a kind of distraction is because helicopter parenting also makes for people who are more reliant on their social lives, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. I mean, this generation has been using social media for as long as they've been using social media, so they're used to being able to access their loved ones whenever they need to. This is why 60% of younger millennials are in a group chat with their friends, and 44% check that group chat every single day. Now the problem is that now they are in their early 20s, which means not everybody will have the time to hit up the group chat. And so we see Streamline Bonding. Streamline Bonding acknowledges that this generation doesn't only need to have a sense of closeness in their social lives, but even in their work lives as well. It's all about different devices being built into chat apps to create more of a sense of closeness when it comes to younger consumers. One great example of this is a service called Supportive, which is great for both a social life and for a working life. Basically, it provides different templates to use when you want to approach the idea of conflict resolution, creating more closeness in a relationship, a really great resource when trying to create that sort of social bond that younger employees expect. The Nouveau Millennial is expectant, optimistic, and highly sociable. Now this wraps up our millennial module. Some key takeaways here, the pro millennial is highly competitive and looking to talk a bit more about being able to achieve those milestones. The mid millennial is very anxious but favors experience over products. And the nouveau millennial is unsure about what their next steps are and looking to create more social bonds in their social lives as well as in the workplace. Now for some workshopping questions. How could you help the pro-millennial battle those millennial misconceptions? What is one small tweak to your product or service that could help ease mid-millennial anxieties? And how would your company change if you gave nouveau millennials more responsibility?